what motivates this particular work package of the project is uh, this observation that you can see across various cultures, across various religions, that people seem to have this intuition that children have some kind of special access to the divine. Okay, you, you hear this kind of language sometimes in uh, Christian circles, certainly in Hinduism. When I was traveling in India as a doctoral student doing cross-cultural research there, uh, a Brahmin on a train uh, was, was helping me understand my own data by just saying, well, look, children have been with the divine, been with God more recently, and so they haven't forgotten. Um, and so this is, <laughs> this is why it is that children seem to be really receptive to ideas of the divine. Um, but running against that basic idea is this problem. Is, is Aren't children sort of conceptually handicapped for thinking about theology or religion? Because their minds just haven't developed. And these are complex, abstract kinds of problems. And so since Piaget, uh, Jean Piaget, in, um, in the history of, of psychology, there's been this strong um, sort of theme that children, uh, until they're at least you know, eight, nine years old, just don't have the right cognitive equipment. Their minds aren't sort of strong enough in the right ways to think about divine properties and attributes. And so for them, well, all that God means or whatever you know, deity term you want to use there, all it means is a special kind of human who maybe lives in a different place. But otherwise, it's really just a, a human being. Okay, the idea that they are anthropomorphic, maybe crudely anthropomorphic, not because it's a useful strategy, because it's all they have to think uh, by, about uh, God's wish, because their minds just can't do otherwise. And so I started research in this area um, with that as a backdrop, reading in so many different textbooks and uh, even religious education books that, that you, you, with children um, younger than about eight years old, you can't even bother trying to teach them about divine attributes or divine properties. They just can't get it. Okay? So we thought, well, that's interesting, because all they do is think that God is a human being. All right. So this study, we're, we're addressing that question and doing it cross culturally. And here are participants in this study were 436 children total, ranging in age from about three years to seven years old. Okay? 189 of those were from China. And uh, with thanks again to uh, Professor Zhu's uh, lab and her her assistance with her students and so forth and uh, uh, recruiting uh, here in China and then 247 children were from Ecuador, which is an interesting uh, comparison population. You sorry, usually you will see the comparison with you know American kids, but here's a place that um, arguably kids are really steeped in. Uh, a cultural environment that has lots of talk about supernatural agents. Okay, and as you heard from the title, uh, we're actually interested in this particular study of looking at, well, not necessarily a high god, but these three supernatural beings. Okay, so we looked at Sun Wukong, uh, Jade Emperor, and Wang Bodhisattva. All right, and I apologize for my pronunciation. And in the Ecuadorian sample, then we had three different supernatural agents that would be culturally familiar to those children. Santa Claus, an angel, and the Virgin Mary. Okay. The method here is a variation on a, a tried and true experimental design from developmental psychology, cognitive developmental psychology. It's a, um, a surprise and contents task. Sometimes these are called false belief tasks. Um, the standard task is that children are presented with a familiar container and they're, that something familiar has been taken out of it um, and something surprising has been put in it and then it's closed back up again and children are asked if someone else came in and saw the container for the first time would they know what's inside of it and famously three-year-olds say yes okay that the person would think that even though there's something completely new inside of that, somehow the person has access to what's in there. By the time they're five, they figure out, oh, somebody would make a mistake. Let me try to illustrate our version of the task, which is slightly different. Okay, so children were presented with some kind of a nondescript plain box, okay? There are no identifying labels in terms of what might be inside of it. And uh, if I can do this without blocking that. 
projection too much. They're shown a couple of uh, a, a toys that uh, might have been in there, okay? So um, we've got Lightning McQueen and we've got Mater. And uh, then uh, in some kind of a hidden way, I'm gonna put one of them in the box. And then, okay, the box is closed. You can't see what's inside of it. And then we're gonna ask the children, do you know what's inside the box? Do you know, is, do you know whether it's Lightning McQueen or Mater inside the box? Okay. And actually most children knew full well that they did not know. They might try to venture a guess and say, well, do you really know or are you just guessing? And they, no, I'm just guessing. I don't really know what's in there, okay? So we put them in a situation of ignorance and that's why it's an ignorance Okay. Well, what's the point of this? In previous studies using this kind of box with familiar contents, children seem to think that everybody, or the, the youngest children, I should say, the three-year-old seems to think everybody knows what's inside the box. If I know, say, it's a cracker box, which is a common one that I used in the United States, then even though I put rocks in it, all right, everyone would think that there are rocks in the box. Okay. What would your mother think is in this box? Rocks. Even though it's a cracker box? Yep. Even though she's never seen inside of it? Yep. Okay. But if we ask about God too, of course God would think there are rocks inside the box. If we ask about an elephant, an elephant would think there are rocks inside the box. By the time they're five, they no, a mom would think there are crackers in the box. Elephant would think there are crackers in the box. God would think there are rocks in the box. Okay, so we were able to show that children three, four, five years old, understood that God could, well, if they know what God means, uh, would understand that there, would, God would know that there were rocks in the box, not crackers, okay? And that at the same age, they could understand that mom would think that there are crackers in the box. So five-year-olds, we were able to show, don't treat God just like another human being, okay? But we're upping the ante in this study. We're making it a little bit harder. What about when they themselves don't know what's inside the box? Hence the ignorance myth. Um, before I get to those, because once I throw numbers up, you'll start reading those and you'll stop listening to me. So the important things about the ignorance task is, in this case, the child themselves don't know what's in the box. All right, I want to make that clear. So you as the child sitting there, you don't know if it's Mater or if it's Lightning McQueen in the box, right? Everybody? So, computationally, this is a difficult problem now, trying to imagine what somebody else might think about the contents. Now, I imagine you think that this is computationally difficult. Yeah, because you have to imagine what might be in there instead of what is in there. So that's a little bit harder than just, oh, I know what's in there. Now, uh, and from an adult perspective, I assume if we asked, um, He's no good because, uh, well, well uh, Ryan Nichols here, if we were wondering, does he know what's in the box? If I asked you, if you know, if, if, if Ryan Nichols knows what's in the box, box, what would you say? Okay, I saw one person go, no. Right, I mean, how would he know? I, I did it, you know, back here. He, he had no access, he's not a supernatural agent. Um, so presumably he wouldn't know, right? So that would be the adult response. I don't know, it's pretty clear to me, he, he won't know. Um, but what if I ask about these various sort of supernatural agents, all right? Will kids treat the supernatural agents just like Ryan? And if so, how? And this is kind of what we found with the uh, Chinese sample. And this kind of fun and interesting. I'll, I'll walk you through it here. What you're seeing is, three-year-olds, five, uh, four, five, and six-year-olds. And what they answered, uh, this is expressed as a percentage of time they said that the agent, the being in question, would know which one it is in the box. Okay, so this is the percent of yes, they would know that response. They're attributing knowledge. They're attributing access to what's in the box. And these are the, the percentages here. If it's the sort of this uh, a neutral color here is not, uh, for those of you who are interested in this sort of thing, not significantly different from 50% answering. 
If it's a different color, it is significantly different from a 50% answer. It's not clear, because it's a yes for the psychologists in the room, there are a few around here nodding along and stuff. Um, because it's a yes, no task, you might think chance answering is 50%. It's not clear to me, actually, frankly, I'd be interested in your reactions and discussion time, uh, what the null hypothesis, the right one is. Because remember, the kid has just said, I don't know what's in there. So really, if all children understand, I don't know, and no one else should know, because this was done in secret, it was hidden. Mom isn't in the room, she didn't see what just happened. My friend isn't in the room and didn't see what just happened. The answer should be no, right? So. The, from the adult perspective, and that's what you're starting to see out here with the six-year-olds, yeah, no one else knows either. So really, if the kid is thinking, what, putting themselves in the other person's perspective, they should be saying no 100% of the time. Yes, 0% of the time, right? That's not what they're doing. Okay, so the three-year-olds, even though they don't know what's in the box, actually a slight majority are answering Yes, 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 yes. For a parent, friend, Sun Wukong, Guayan Bodhisattva, not being emperor, but that's still a lot higher than where they're going, down here with, with you. All right? By the time they're four, they're actually significantly answering yes, even above that 50% chance level for the supernatural agents. And now they're below chance for a parent and friend. So by age four, they're already answering differently between the, the natural and the supernatural agents. They are not anthropomorphizing, okay? They're not just treating these like human beings. And then that pattern just gets stronger for five and six year olds, okay? So they seem to already be picking up and making the right prediction about these supernatural agents that they have more access to what's in the box in this mundane, boring task. And one of the reasons we use a task like this is it's, not, it's, it's, it's Unlikely children were taught something like this scenario. So we know they're not just saying, oh yeah, well, I was watching this cartoon about the Jade Emperor and he always knows what's in these unmarked boxes. And no, that's, that's peculiar, right? So letting them draw inferences in a novel context. Okay? The uh, uh, Ecuadorian sample is actually works in a similar basic pattern, but stronger in some respects in that the youngest children actually are attributing knowledge significantly above that 50% chance level to everybody, okay? Would a dog know what's in the box? Yeah. Would a parent know? Yeah. Friend, yes. Mary, Angel, Santa Claus, they all know. The difference here is that these supernatural agents, you see a developmental decline in what they know, with one exception, the angel, all right? Because in this cultural environment, Santa Claus doesn't have special access to that kind of knowledge. Yeah, he's sort of a special supernatural agent, but not a knowing one. And neither is the Virgin Mary. Okay, so those decline with age, even though the, the starting point was high. So what and who cares, right? All right. Together with other studies that I've done in this area, looking at particularly God and what God knows in the Western context, and we've replicated in other Latin American countries as well, uh, as Israel and Albania now. Um, young children attribute greater knowledge to others than they themselves possess, okay? So it's not the case that a child is an egocentric kind of reasoner in this kind of task. They don't just go, oh, what I know is what other people know. No, actually they give other people the benefit of the doubt. I'm ignorant, but I assume mom would know. I'm ignorant, but my friend would know. I'm ignorant, but the dog would know. Okay? I'm ignorant, but certainly Jane Emperor would know. So there's a bias then to attribute more knowledge, more access to information than the child themselves have. It's a little more pronounced in the Ecuadorian sample than it is in the Chinese sample. They're a little more humble about this. The Chinese are more humble about this, but, uh, but it's there. The three and four year olds, depending on which agent you're talking about and which sample, also distinguish among these intentional beings in terms of potential knowledge. That is, it's not that they treat all of them exactly the same. Okay, the Ecuadorians look pretty much the same at three years old, whereas the Chinese are already distinguishing amongst agent, agents at age three. By four, both groups are distinguishing. All right, so they're not, strictly speaking, 
anthropomorphic. They are able to reason about different kinds of agents as different from human beings, even at four years old, and in some cases at three years old. That's pretty cool, okay? It's a big change from what Piaget and many of Piagetians uh, have argued. And the fun thing is that they're actually better at getting these supernatural agents right than they are getting their mom right. They assume their mom knows things that their mom doesn't know. They assume these supernatural agents know things that the supernatural agents would know. All right? It's a bigger developmental achievement to figure out mom's limitations than it is to figure out the super-knowing agents. All right? There were cross-cultural differences, and those are really fun. Right? Chinese children were more hesitant to attribute knowledge than the Ecuadorians, and it's certainly the case that the particular supernatural agent in question matters. Right? So there, there's, there's definitely effective cultural learning there. But the fun take-home point, I think, is that there's this relative naturalness to acquiring these supernatural agent concepts. If the child's default assumption is, even in this very difficult task, to attribute more knowledge, more perceptual access than what is naturally the case, my argument is that makes it really easy for them to acquire these concepts, particularly if that agent has those attributes. Not all supernatural agents do have those attributes, right? Some are pretty dumb. Some are pretty, no, no, they don't know what's in the box. Well, then those look a whole lot more like a human being in terms of how much time it takes to learn about them. But a super knowing God, easy peasy, lemon squeezy, as some people say, uh, we can pick up those concepts, no problem. It sure looks like it. Much younger than what previous research seems to suggest. And I think that's uh, so. Reasoning about super uh, super knowing beings presents no special challenge to young children. It seems to me. All right. Any uh, and by special, I just mean over and above reasoning and about other kinds of beings. Um, they naturally over attribute knowledge to others, even when they're in a state of ignorance. When they know, it's they, they just go off the chart and say everybody else knows too. Um, whether it's to humans or superhumans, they start by over attributing knowledge, and then they have to pair that back for reasoning about human beings. But if it's a supernatural agent, they don't have to do the pairing back. Regardless of whether the superhumans are actually regarded by adults as supernatural. And that's how we know this isn't just indoctrination. Right? And the Ecuadorian sample actually showed that really well, because they end up starting out, oh yeah, Santa Claus would know. And then, you know, a few of the years later they're going, oh yeah, actually no, not so much. Because they're learning something about Santa Claus. They start by assuming Santa Claus has this special knowledge. They learn that he doesn't. Okay. Super knowing gods then are really easy for children to think about, to learn about, and so in some ways they're relatively natural. And that is, I'll stop there. See, I made up time for talking too much at the beginning. <laughs> <laughs>